Hey, FOMO sapiens, it's New Year's Eve Eve, meaning December 30th, almost New Year's. And I think New Year's is a good time to stop and reflect. And I want to share with you today, I think, I mean, I don't like to choose favorites, but one of my very, very favorite interviews in all of the catalog of FOMO sapiens. We're talking best of, but more, this is like really best of. And it's a conversation I had with Bruce Feiler. Now, Bruce wrote this beautiful book called Life is in the Transitions, and his life has inspired actually a TV show that was on NBC about the fact that he he had made this, this council of dads because he thought he was not going to be around to raise his daughters. He had a very serious diagnosis of cancer. And this book, Life is in the Transitions, is all about really what we do when life throws us a big steaming pile of manure, as it were. And, and it's basically about the fact that all of us are going to face challenges and we, we we can get through them, but we need to understand the patterns that we can we can learn from and how other people have faced these challenges. And that's what Bruce did. He actually studied the lives of hundreds of people and then kind of like did an algorithm to figure out the kinds of changes and challenges we faced and then how we can get through them. And in fact, you can come out a lot happier and more successful. So as we head into 2022, I just wanted to share this episode because it could be a wonderful way to, you, I don't know, think about how you're going to pr- approach the coming year because it's been it's been tough let's obviously admit that it's been really tough but there is so much good out there too and if we focus on that and prepare ourselves good things can happen so listen to the episode consider checking out Bruce's book life is in the transitions i found it to be it was it's stunning i've given it to so many people i've recommended it bruce is just like a sage and a good man at that and with that i wish you a very 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 happy new years wherever you are and i will see you in 2022. FOMO. This is my kind of moonshot dream for life is in the transitions, which is to rebrand them. Not as periods that we have to grit and grind and meditate and, you know, sort of suffer our way through, but these are periods for reinvention and renewal. And every great religion has these periods, whether it's Hinduism in the forest or the Abrahamic religions in the desert, you know, all the great stories, Oedipus and Achilles, all Hercules, all these people go out into the unknown. You have to lose your sight of the, of the ground in order to discover someplace new. But these are periods that are essential to life. That's Bruce Feiler, the author of Life is in the Transitions, Mastering Change at Any Age. I'm your host, Patrick McGinnis, and this is FOMO Sapiens, part of the HBR Presents Network. We live in a world of overwhelming options, and whether you're an entrepreneur, an executive, or just someone who wants to make the most out of your time and money, committing to just one thing can feel impossible. That's called FOMO, and it's short for fear of missing out. How do I know? Because I coined the term. Welcome to FOMO Sapiens, the show where I ask entrepreneurial thinkers how they make personal and professional decisions in a world of overwhelming choice. FOMO. FOMO. I'll never forget the first time I heard Bruce Feiler tell a story. It was 2016, and I was on the Caribbean island of St. Lucia on a work project. I know, pretty tough life, right? Since it was the weekend, I was sitting by the pool and listening to old episodes of the Moth podcast. Now, if you don't know the Moth, it consists of stories that were recorded in front of a live audience. And Bruce's story, which was called The Council of Dads, centered on the aftermath of him learning that he was suffering from a rare form of cancer. After asking himself who would be there for his daughters if he were to die, Bruce assembled six extraordinary men, men who had shaped his own life, and asked them to do exactly the same for his daughters. He called this group of six the Council of Dads. Now, I'm going to come clean here and admit that I cried most of the way through this story. Not just a few tears either. I'm talking about an ugly, ugly cry to the point where people were actually looking at me. Part of the reason why the story hit me so hard is that while I hadn't yet met Bruce, I have known his wife, Linda Rottenberg, for a long time through Endeavor, a global entrepreneurship nonprofit that she had founded. And so I was right there with her during the story. The other reason that Bruce's story shook me so much was that he took me through a tough transition in a way that felt so personal that I also just sort of felt like I was in the driver's seat right there with him. And by the way, lots of people agree with me. The Council of Dads became a best-selling book and even a primetime series on NBC. And I'll admit, when I watch the show, I have an ugly cry too. Now, Bruce is back with a book that is tailor-made for this moment in time. It's called Life is in the Transitions, Mastering Change at Any Age. And it's about how we can manage through the occasional ups and downs, as well as the seismic changes that make life unpredictable and end up defining our existence. 
And Bruce didn't just come up with his take on transitions in a vacuum. He went out on the road and interviewed hundreds of people and then coded their experiences using data analytics to figure out how people manage transitions, what works, what doesn't, and how we can make changes in our lives to succeed. It's a beautiful book. It's made a deep impression upon me, and it's actually changed the way I think starting about a week ago. I actually see the world a little differently than I did before. And then stick around for the faux moment of the show when we'll talk a little bit more about one of the central themes in the book, how to change the narrative of your life story when things around you suddenly change. It's an essential life skill, and it's one that I have learned to use and learned to apply to my own life a bunch of times over the last decade, and so I want to talk about it with you in depth. And now on to the interview. To get started, I asked Bruce to tell me just what inspired him to write a book about managing change. Really, the reason that it happened is that my life story sort of exploded. I mean, I had what I now think of as a linear life. Like, I grew up in Savannah, Georgia. Uh, I went to Yale. I went to Japan. I started writing letters home. And when I got back to Georgia six months later, everyone said, I loved your letters. I was like, great. Have we met? And it turned out that my grandmother had Xeroxed them and passed them around, and they went kind of viral, the old-fashioned sense of the word. I thought I should write a book about this. And so I, in my 20s, I wrote books about Japan and England, and I spent a year as a circus clown. In my 30s, I went back and forth, as you know, to the Middle East, writing books, retracing the Bible and exploring you know, sort of the role of religion in contemporary life. And this would have been my life. But in my 40s, I had a back-to-back-to-back set of disruptive life experiences. First, at 43, as a dad of three-year-old girls, I got diagnosed with a rare, hyper-rare, aggressive pediatric cancer through our lives up in the air. I formed a council of dads that became the show on NBC. Uh, Then, that was around the time of the Great Recession. My family was hit very hard in in the real estate business in Georgia. And then my dad, who at the time was about 20 years into Parkinson's, got very depressed and tried to kill himself six times in 12 weeks. So I have all of this stuff happening. And then with my dad, I'm, you know, we were dealing with business and medical, but I'm the story guy, right? I'm the meaning guy. So I started sending my dad a question every Monday morning that became years, right? Like, tell me about the toys you played with, the house you grew up in, how'd you join, how'd you join the Navy? How'd you meet mom? And this man who had never written anything longer than a memo backed into writing an autobiography. And it was incredibly powerful. And I got very interested in how when our lives get disrupted, we have to rethink and rewrite our life story. And as I told the story to everyone around me, everybody had a similar story. My wife had a headache, went to the hospital and died. My daughter tried to kill herself. My boss is a crook. My brother's being diagnosed with stage four cancer. And what everybody was saying to me in one way or another was like the life I'm living is not the life I expected. Like I'm, I'm discombobulated. I'm like living life out of order. And I called my wife, Linda, and I said, no one knows how to tell their story anymore. And like, I have to do something about it. And so what I did, I spent five years gathering hundreds of stories, people who lost homes, lost limbs, changed careers, changed genders, got out of cults, got sober. And then with a team of 12 people, I spent a year coding these stories, trying to tease out themes and takeaways that could help all of us survive and thrive in times of change. And you write in the introduction to the book, the proper response to a setback is a story. And I, and I highlighted that because as regular listeners know, I love transitions basically because I had a really tough transition in 2008 during the financial crisis that opened many doors for me that I had never expected to be open. But I remember for years, the hardest thing for me was the fact that I didn't know how to tell my own story anymore because I was stuck on the old story and I hadn't flipped the page yet to the new one. Now, you start with chapter one. The title of chapter one is Farewell to the Linear Life. And I think that's exactly the point, is that we tend to think that life is going to unfold in a predictable fashion. But in fact, I think about the old uh, song lyric from John Lennon, uh, the song Beautiful Boy, which is, life is what happens when you're busy making other plans. So talk about why the linear life? First of all, why would we even believe that? And, and, and then what has changed so that it's no longer something that we should believe in? One of the things that really made this whole project, I don't know, fall into place when the coins dropped in the slots and the seven showed up was when I stumbled into this idea that we never talk about that turns out to be very powerful, which is that every culture kind of has a paradigmatic shape of what life is supposed to be. So in the ancient world, they thought life was a cycle to every season, turn, turn, turn. 
in the Middle Ages. And I lay all this out in Life is in the Transitions. I found these graphic images of it. Life is a staircase up to middle age and then a staircase down. Okay, no, like new love at 50. No starting an entrepreneurship enterprise at 60. Like no starting over. Like you peak at middle age and then it's straight downhill. And for the last 150 years since the birth of science, we have been told that life is a linear arrow of progress. Okay, and this is we were it was pounded into us. So you've got Piaget, stages of development. Anybody with a kid knows this. Freud with the psychosexual stages of development. Erickson, the eight stages of moral development, the five stages of grief, the the hero's journey. These are all linear constructs. And this reaches its peak in the 70s with Gail Sheehy, who writes this book with largely plagiarized material um, called Passages that all of our mothers read that says everybody does the same thing in their 20s, everyone does the same thing in their 30s, and everybody has a midlife crisis at 39 and a half. And she was so precise. She said it must happen, at, it must begin at 39 and a half, and it must end by 44. This all turns out to be complete bunk, okay? Some people have changes at that time, but some people are born into a difficult life situation. Some people lose a parent when they're teenagers. Some people, I tell an incredible story of Seth Manuka and a, 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 now a star journalist and tenured MIT professor. He was addicted to heroin and got it, the turning point in his life was 26. You might get a diagnosis, um, as I did. You, you may have a child with special needs in your 30s. You may lose a parent in your 50s. You may get fired in your 60s. You may start an entrepreneurial enterprise in your 70s. Like These things do not clump in middle age. And so what I have tried to do in this book is kind of say that how we understand the world has changed, but how we think about our lives hasn't. So kind of the big idea here is that the linear life is dead. It's been replaced by what I am coining in this in, in life is in the transitions as the nonlinear life. And that nonlinear life involves many, many more life transitions than we expect. And these are something that uh, life transitions are a skill that you can and must master. It's like the most urgent skill that we all need right now. FOMO. FOMO. And so you went out all over the country and you interviewed people and not just famous people or people who were successful, but people from all walks of life in every state in America. What did you learn? What were the commonalities that you saw among all of these disparate stories? The most surprising thing that I learned from listening to this story is that I went in thinking that the toolkit for navigating life transitions, if it involved, say, business, getting fired or starting a new enterprise, or personal mental illness, physical illness, a diagnosis, family, having a child with special needs, having to care for an aging parent, you know, changing religions, changing genders, that each of these things getting sober, 25% of my stories involved addiction in some ways, though I didn't seek it out. I would have thought it would have been a different toolkit for the different areas of life. And it turns out, and this was an area where I was completely wrong, that the toolkit is the same, like that the basic skills you need to navigate a life transition are the same. And so kind of just to you know, set the stage here, what I found is that we all go through a set of what I call disruptors, okay? Events that impede normal life. Some are involuntary, like, you know, uh, your spouse cheats on you or you get laid off. But a lot of them, almost half of them are voluntary. Like you cheat on your spouse, right? Or you choose to leave your company to start, to start a new enterprise or go look for another job. So we go through, it turns out, about three dozen of these disruptors in the course of, of our lives. My data shows this, all of the collective data, that's one every 12 to 18 months. Like that's more often than most people see a dentist. Most of those we get through without very much disrupt to our lives. Okay, we adjust, we, we tweak our stories, we rely on our networks, and we move on. But one in 10 of those, or more commonly, a kind of pileup of more than one, become massive changes. I call these a life quakes because life quakes are bigger on the Richter scale of consequences and their aftershocks can last for years. As I think about these life quakes, you, you touched on something that I think is really provocative. We tend to think that the world happens to us and that the big changes are foisted upon us. But what you said is that in half of occasions, we're deciding. We're deciding to cheat on our spouse. We're deciding to steal the money doesn't have to be negative. We're deciding to start that business that becomes a billion dollar business. And I think that that is something we may not on the surface appreciate is that we do have a lot of agency in shaping the big things in our life that do happen to us. 
And so I did all these interviews, had a thousand hours of interviews. Okay, like the transcripts reached the shoulders of my adolescent daughters. And I had a bunch of millennials, graduate students and undergraduates in, in different fields who were doing the coding with me. And we would go, we have these like murder boards, like, you know, like we argued about everything. We coded for voluntary and involuntary. So 53% of the biggest life quake was, were involuntary and 47% were voluntary. So I'm a boomer and I said, wow, 47% of these changes are still voluntary? These millennials were like, whoa, 53% of these are involuntary? Like to them, they're like, wow, I'm planning my life and I'm gonna be upended. So what's interesting is, so we made, I made, we made this matrix, voluntary, involuntary, also personal and collective, okay? So personal is something that happens to you, you know, or to your family, but collective is happens to everybody, right? So that could be a tornado, it could be the Great Recession. 9-11 is one that came up a lot. The smallest category was involuntary collective. What are we doing in 2020? We are all going through an involuntary collective life break at the same time. That is what's happening to us now. And there's a line in my book that was sort of a throwaway line when I wrote it, which was, had I done these in the 20th century with two world wars and a depression, there would have been many more of these. In fact, now this is almost like a psychological corrective to all of us to realize that we're all in this together. And if you listen to the conversations now in the world in the wake of the pandemic is, is my job giving me meaning? There's a finding in my book, 61% of people move in the life transition. I don't know about you, but 61% of the conversations I'm in, someone is talking about moving. Do I want, I just read that a third, of, a third of women are thinking about delaying having children because they don't have the resources. So all, we're all going through this together. And I think we're just beginning to understand the implications of this shared collective involuntary life quake. Now, you're right. I don't think any of us would have expected, obviously, what we're living through today. And yet we see some people who are doing pretty well yeah. and other people who are not. And part of that is just their economic considerations and all our lifestyles and there's all kinds of things. But then part of it is definitely that some people can manage the transitions better. So as you research these people and you observed um, how they live through these transitions, what did you learn about how we can manage transition um, and, and, and what can we take away as we all face this moment together? First of all, um, I want to say, because we were just talking about life quakes, the life quake can be voluntary or involuntary, but the transition itself must be voluntary. Like you have to choose to enter this state of change. And then once you do, you're going to probably feel like overwhelmed, stuck. Am I going to be okay? I'm never going to get through it. Okay. Particularly if it's, you have a loss or you've been fired, right? Or you have a child with special needs or something that's just really, you know, kind of just deadly. You're going to feel stuck for a while. The transition is the actual mechanism of getting unstuck. One thing that happened to me sitting across from people listening day after day, weeping with people as they share their life stories is that certain patterns do become clear and it tends to be reassuring to understand this. So the first thing is that life transitions involve three phases. And the three phases are, these are my names for them, the long goodbye in which you kind of tame the emotions and say goodbye to the old self. There's this messy middle where you shed certain habits and create new ones. And then there's this new beginning where you begin to unveil your new self and kind of rewrite your story. Now, in the first century of thinking about life transitions, people were told that you had to do these in order. My last big book on transitions was 50 years ago, and it said you must do them in order in order to succeed. It's sort of like they said about the five stages of grief. This is just wrong. So you've got these phases. People do them in their own idiosyncratic fingerprint of a way. And in each of those phases, there turn out to be tools that you can do to make each of them go more effectively. There are lots of changes that are foisted upon us because something happens externally. But how could we have made those changes before? What decisions can we take without having to go through the life quakes? I'm curious how you think about that. Are there certain things that people can do to make the change before external events sort of blow up their life? The short answer is... It's not a fairy tale until the wolf shows up. We think of our lives as these fairy tales and we're, there's going to be a hero and the hero is going to have a happy ending. But the truth is that a wolf is going to appear, a monster, an ogre, a tornado, a diagnosis, a downsizing, a pandemic. 
And the truth is, that's going to happen, but that's when the heroes are made. Like, don't shy away from the scary parts that that's when the heroes are made. So I don't believe that we can avoid these entirely. It's the nature of life. In fact, the reason my book is called Life is in the Transitions is because my research shows we have three to five of these life quakes in the course of our lives, and that the average length of the transitions that grows out of them is five years. And so if you think three to five in a lifetime, four, five, or six years, that's 25 years. That's half of our adult lives. Okay, you or someone you know, I'm talking to the people listening right now, you or someone you know is going through a transition right now. In fact, you both may be going through them. Every household in America has someone going through them. And so you can't make them go away. But once they happen, you can manage them more efficiently. The first question I asked in my conversations when we got to the life quake of how you got through it, when you got to the transition was, tell me the emotion that you struggled most with. The number one answer was fear. The number two answer was sadness. And the number three answer was shame. So the first step is actually in my seven toolkit. The first step is accept it, is to identify the emotion that you're struggling with, accept that it's real, and then use a ritual or, or, or something like that to mark it. So what would I say to people who feel stuck and for whom the long goodbye is hard? Try to identify what emotion you're feeling and then use a ritual of some kind. This was so fascinating to me. People jump out of airplanes. They get, they get tattoos, okay? They hold farewell parties. They write letters to their parents. I have an incredible story of a guy who was working at Lego and who always felt that he was a woman. And he's then caught in 9-11 and covered in, in, in soot. And he decides, I would, I'd rather die alone because he thinks his parents will abandon him. He'll lose his job. He wants to transition to what he believes is his true self as a woman. And so he sits down and he writes a letter to his parents saying, I'm really a woman. I've known this for a long time and I'm going to begin this process. And they embraced him. This is a, st a story like this with a happy ending. And so what was the ritual he did? He threw a hormone party for all of her friends um, to gather together to say, I'm putting this old person behind and I'm moving toward this new person. So people use rituals. Once you identify the emotion, you get it out and then you can do something to kind of contain it and tame it, which allows you then to move in to the messy middle, which is going to involve shedding habits. And in the, in the case of Naomi Clark, shedding an entire gender identity, and then also using creativity to begin to build your new self. FOMO. FOMO. Now, one thing that uh, I think about as you tell these stories is that, of course, these are decisions that we make to enter a transition. But of course, we live in society, we live in families, we live in communities. So as we see the people around us uh, who are going through transitions, how can each of us help people as they go through that journey? Do you think the transitions have a pilot and they also have a co-pilot? One of the questions that I ask people is, you know, is what type of advice from friends was most helpful? And it turns out that we all have a kind of phenotype of advice, a kind of phenotype of a friend that we respond to. This was, I've never read this anywhere. This is actually one of the things in, in uh, Life is in the Transitions that's, I think, entirely original uh, that just happened because I sat with people and listened to them. I mean, it's not anything I made up. It's like it was coming from these people. So it turns out that some people like uh, comforters, okay? That's the most popular. I love you, Patrick. You'll get through it. I believe in you, right? That's comforting, okay? That's one type of way to be helpful. Other people like nudging. I like you, Patrick, you know, you'll get through this, but don't you think that you should go to AA or like, don't you think you should take a course or don't you think you should lose a little weight or don't you think you should stand up to your boss? So that's nudging. There's another kind of person who likes what I've called a slapper after the scene in Moonstruck when Cher is slapping. Um, oh my gosh. What's his name? I have to, um, Nicholas Cage. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Didn't even see the movie, but I know that. <laughs> yeah, so there's a moment where Cher is saying, wake up, wake up, and she's slapping uh, Nick Cage. So a slapper is, I love you, Patrick, but get over yourself. You're really deluding yourself. Like, this thing isn't going to happen, or it's really time, or, or you really are addicted, or this job is really toxic, or you need to finally tell your mother to back off, or whatever it might be. And then there's another kind of phenotype, which is that some people respond to mentors that they don't even know. Like this happened with the transgender people. It, it often happened with the, uh, the people facing addiction or, or people who came out 
uh, generations ago when they were when they were not a lot of of, of of LGBT people that they knew is that they respond to a public figure who's out there who becomes a role model. So you should not assume that the kind of advice that you want is the kind of advice that the person you're trying to help wants. In fact, you might even ask them. <laughs> you know, we have this thing with my, with my daughters. Like they would bring me a piece of writing every now and then. Right now they're like, Dad, we don't need you. And I would say, Do you want me to tell you how wonderful it is, or do you want me to tell you how to make it better? And I sort of wanted their buy-in. And eventually we kind of settled that what for them was the right answer, which was both, <laughs> okay? Some people just want to be told, it's great. This is great, Patrick. Like, awesome, nice job. You know, get a pat, get a, give you a pat on the back. Some people, I actually want to, I kind of like a slapper, to be honest. I like someone saying, I believe you can do it, but this sucks. And like, go do it again. So I would ask the person you're going through what type of, of advice they want. And don't assume it's always going to be the same. And for those who are listening out there, if you are trying to help me, I think I want a comforter, but what I really need is a slapper. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, amazing. Uh, so Bruce, you wrote this book, not knowing we were coming to this pandemic, but obviously here we are. And so what is your advice for all of our listeners who everybody's in the same boat, as you mentioned in this time? I would say three things I've taken away from this project of talking to people about their transitions and then coding them and then writing it down and life is in the transitions. Number one, transitions work. Like this is the human mechanism for getting through it. 90% of the people that I spoke to said that their transition came to an end. So you may think it's going to be long and unbearable, but transitions work. Number two, transitions have a toolkit. There actually are things you can do. We have learned about happiness. We have learned about habits. We have learned about cooking. We have learned about tennis. We have learned about garden, gardening. You can do things. You can break tasks down into small micro tasks, get small wins. If you deploy the toolkit that I have assembled in Life is in the Transitions, your transition will go more efficiently and more effectively. And third, I would say, Transitions are essential. We have, we have something, like this is my kind of moonshot dream for life is in the transitions, which is to rebrand them. Not as periods that we have to grit and grind and meditate and you know, sort of suffer our way through, but these are periods for reinvention and renewal. And every great religion has these periods, whether it's Hinduism in the forest or the Abrahamic religions in the desert, you know, all the great stories, Oedipus and Achilles, all Hercules, all these people go out into the unknown. You have to lose your sight of the, of the ground in order to discover someplace new. But these are periods that are essential to life. And if you just try to shut down and suffer your way through it, um, you are missing what is the opportunity. William James, the founder of psychology, said it best a century ago, life is in the transitions as much as the terms connected. So we have to view these as powerful periods. And if we do, we can transform them from ones of chaos and fear into ones of, of growth, creativity, and renewal. Bruce Feiler, author of Life is in the Transitions. Thanks so much for stopping by. My pleasure, Patrick. Thank you for having me. FOMO. Can't get enough of FOMO Sapiens? Join me on Patreon for ad-free episodes, bonus material, and exclusive content that will help you to master FOMO and position yourself for greater success in both business and life. Go to patreon.com slash FOMO Sapiens to learn more. You can also connect with me on Instagram at Patrick J. McGinnis, on Twitter at PJ McGinnis, and on LinkedIn. I love hearing from you, so don't be shy. FOMO Sapiens is recorded in New York City. Theme music is by Mike McGinnis, and editing and post-production is by Josh Elstrom. If you like today's show, please be sure to rate it and recommend it to your friends. And as always, you can find me at FOMOSapiens.com and at PatrickMcGinnis.com. To advertise on FOMO Sapiens, reach out to contact at FOMOSapiens.com. FOMO. FOMO. FOMO.